The theme we're following today in our services is changing communities. Archbishop William Temple used to say this, the church is the only society that exists for the benefit of those who are not its members. That's quite a thought, isn't it? The church isn't like a club whose main aim is to provide for those who belong to it. It's there for those outside it. So they can hear the gospel, and so their lives and the communities in which they and we live can be changed. Now, churches don't always look like that, but they are at their best when they are engaging with issues in their community, whether it's on a national or global scale, with things like in the past, campaigns to end slavery or improve factory conditions, or more recently, to tackle world poverty and racial discrimination, or if it's in more local ways, like our Saltaire Canteen or the Shipley Food Bank, or the church's work to support asylum seekers. It is a fact that often it's Christians who are in the forefront of movements for changing communities, changing them for the better. But as we will see, we don't have a monopoly of that. Now, this evening's Gospel was a very familiar parable of Jesus, and it seems very straightforward. But when you look at it a bit more closely, it raises some quite contentious issues and questions. But then Jesus' teaching wasn't designed to lull people to sleep and make them feel comfortable. And I don't believe that's what sermons are for either. So if you're sitting uncomfortably, I'll carry on. <laughs> Let's first see where Matthew places that parable about the sheep and the goats that we heard in this evening's Gospel. He puts it in a chapter with two other familiar parables and it follows a chapter which speaks about the return of Jesus and the last days. Now the other two parables that come before this one are on the theme of waiting for somebody to come and what you're doing while you're waiting. The first one is the parable about the ten virgins who are waiting for a bridegroom to come and they have their lamps with them And as we know, five of them didn't take spare supplies of oil for their lamps, and their lamps ran out. And while they went to go and get some more oil, the bridegroom arrived, everybody went in, and they missed out on it. And I guess that the message of that is that if you're waiting for the return of Jesus, be prepared for it. The second parable is about the master who gets his servants to account for the money he's given them when he goes away and how they've used it. And the servants who have used it to benefit him and to make a profit for him are praised and rewarded. And the servant who hides it in the ground is rebuked and condemned. And I guess the message of that parable is, as you wait for Jesus to return, use what God has given you to further his work. And then we come to the parable of the sheep and the goat. And now in this parable, it's a sort of picture of how Jesus has returned. And there's some accounting to be done. And a division is made. And that picture of sheep and goats would have been very familiar to the hearers because they would know how in their communities the shepherds would separate the sheep and goats who had been feeding together on the pastures and in the fields to bring them in in the evenings. Now, one group is invited to take their inheritance, the kingdom prepared for them, since the creation of the world. And that's where a big issue arises, and a big question. Because, you see, the basis on which they're invited is the way they have cared for those in need. How they have fed the hungry and the thirsty, how they brought the stranger in and cared for him on clothed the unclothed, how they minister to those who are sick or in prison. That's what it's based on. There's nothing in that about having the right beliefs or having faith or following the right religious practices 
or even actually knowing Jesus. So what are we to make of that? And how can we tie that up with other parts of the Bible which say things like this about our going on into God's kingdom? For example, in Romans chapter 10, it says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Nothing about caring for the needy in that. All about faith in Jesus. And then in, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, it is by grace that you are saved. Is there a contradiction here between this idea that salvation comes through knowing Jesus and having faith in him, or it comes through caring and ministering to those in need? Well, I think in a way there is a contradiction in that. So what do we do about it? Well, I think one of the features about the Bible is that we sometimes have to hold together things that seem very contradictory, but actually are different ways of looking at the truth, different aspects of the same truth. I'll give you one or two examples of that so you can see what I mean about it. For example, uh, we're told in the Bible, and we're taught, and it's the basis of our faith, that Jesus is at the same time fully God and fully man. How can he be that? I can't understand that. And yet it's the basis of our faith. And I believe it's true. In this service, a little bit later, we're going to receive bread and wine. And that bread and wine remains bread and wine all the time. And yet somehow, as we receive it, we actually receive the body and blood of Christ. And in that, we receive his presence. I have no idea how that happens. But I believe it does. And there may be a rather silly example. I believe that the music of heaven will not be of harps, but will be traditional jazz. The organist at the church where I was vicar down in Surrey, she believes that the music of heaven will be Bach's fugues. I don't know, maybe God will make it so that if we do get to heaven, I will hear jazz, she will hear Bach's fugues. And maybe also I'll actually hear Bach and begin to appreciate it a bit more. And maybe she'll hear the jazz and wonder of wonders, actually see something in that too. <laughs> see, sometimes I think we have to hold together two truths. And in this case, it's the truth, on the one hand, that it's Jesus who reveals God to us and opens the way into his presence, but also that entering that presence has something to do with caring about people's needs and working to meet them. After all, Jesus' ministry was a great deal about that. Now, many preachers on this passage take up the idea in it of seeing Jesus in those who are in need. And they give examples. For example, uh, the example of Martin of Tours, and you know this story, who on a freezing winter day got down from his horse took his Roman cloak and split it in two and wrapped it round a freezing cold beggar who was at the roadside. And then that evening he had a vision of Jesus coming to him, holding the half of the cloak, saying, you gave it to me. And we know that when we read about the ministry and the work of Sister Teresa in Calcutta, that she always spoke of doing that work because she saw Jesus in the dying and the destitute that she was working with and that she was ministering to. Seeing Jesus in the human needs of others and serving him in that. We can understand that, and in a sense that's partly behind anything we may do in that way of service. 
But you see, it's very interesting in this parable that these people in the parable who are going into the kingdom that's prepared for them are not actually seeing Jesus in what they're doing. They're actually saying, as they go in, well, Jesus, when did we see you, Lord? They didn't see him there. They're not aware that in their care of the needy and the, and the suffering that they're serving Jesus. They're surprised. They are doing it just because they want to relieve people's need and suffering. Yet they seem to be inheriting the kingdom. It's not us in that group because we know that we're serving Jesus and doing it. It's the people who don't know they're serving Jesus and doing it who seem to be going on into the kingdom of heaven. What on earth is happening here? Does it say something to us about how God works through people who may be of other faiths? People who maybe don't have a faith at all? Something about their place in his plan and his eventual kingdom? Oh, it raises questions. In Matthew's Gospel, it says, uh, John comes to Jesus and he says, Master, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him, because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, said Jesus, for whoever is not against you is for you. So what practical messages can we take from this parable to apply to the way we seek as Christians to change the communities that we live in and the world we live in for the better? Well, firstly, it revolves around that idea which is in the parable and very basic to it, of seeing Jesus in those who are in need. And that's not always very easy. Recently, The Guardian has had some very heart-wrenching stories about the people who have been fleeing from Syria and other places of conflict who have come into Europe and are now living in the most miserable conditions with virtually nothing in camps in the Middle East and here in Europe. They can't return to where they've come from because everything there has been destroyed. And the way forward now is blocked to them. So they're stuck in this sort of limbo. And there they are suffering from the cold, they're suffering from lack of food, often from lack of medicines and suffering from illnesses, and particularly the children. And worst of all, they're suffering from a diminishing of any hope that things will get better. If we can see Jesus speaking to us in their needs, and if those around us and those who have power to do something about it can see Jesus speaking to them through that, then we may begin to see them not as an inconvenience that's not really our responsibility and we wish they'd just go away, but like us, as God's children, whom Jesus calls us to help, just as those in the parable were helping. Then secondly, I think it says to us that we need to take very seriously the way that we can work together with those who may not be Christians in meeting needs in this world. In Beacon, although we're a Christian organisation, we have volunteers who come from other faiths, particularly Muslims, and quite a number who don't have any overt faith at all. And we work together in it. God uses them just as much as he uses those of us who claim to be Christians. As you know, we collect food items for the Red Cross here at church in a box at the back of the church each Sunday. And it goes to the Red Cross to distribute food to destitute asylum seekers. It's really a lifeline for them. Now, it used to be that the Red Cross sent somebody to collect these things and take them down. Now, Mary, Mary Babington takes them down for us, and that's much, much more helpful. But there was a young man who used to come up and collect the food things from here and take them down. And he was so moved by what he saw that we were doing here, he went and talked to the imam at his mosque. And now that mosque collects food for destitute asylum seekers as well. We may be following different faiths, 
but we can actually both be doing God's work. And then thirdly, if we believe that the church's mission is to make the gospel or good news of Jesus known, then an essential part of it is meeting human need. That's very clear in the parable. It's also there in the letter of James, where he talks about having faith and having works or or, or showing your faith in what you are doing in caring for those who are in need. And he says, yeah, you show me your faith, I'll show you my faith in the work that I'm doing. So it belongs together. It's a bit like two blades of a pair of scissors. One that's telling about Jesus and the way that we can discover about God's love and how it becomes real to us in him, and we sometimes call that evangelism. And the other part of the scissors is meeting needs and changing communities for the good. And you see, if a church is doing both those things, it will have a cutting edge. You and I have to work out just where God is calling us in all of this. Because we can't, nobody can do everything. And God calls different people to serve him in different ways. In the area of sharing about Jesus and helping people to discover faith, a personal faith in him. Or caring for people's needs and giving their witness in doing that. But what we can do, whatever God's called us in particular to work with, is to support each other, whether it's in evangelism or working to meet needs. Because in the end, it's by people in the church working together cooperatively in that sort of way, not disowning what other people are doing, but supporting whatever God has called them to do in those two parts of those scissors working together. That's in the end how communities are changed. Amen.